Hello and welcome to the Happy Farm D podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Alex Barker, founder of the Happy Farm D, where we help pharmacists create careers and lives they love and get jobs and do all sorts of other crazy things. <laughs> In this episode, I'm joined by someone I actually two people I really admire. They are the big brains behind the new doctor documentary coming out. Would you like shots with that? Let's get into it because it's a juicy conversation talking about the things that are going on in pharmacy and how this documentary is going to be covering those things in a, I would say in a delicate way. Um, and so with that, let's jump into the interview. <laughs> Ooh, we're, and we're live. We're not going to put me in my butt sitting down. <laughs> Although maybe we should, like, at the end or something. Keep it real, right? Yeah, and let's. Showing off my butt is what our viewers want. Um, as an April Fool's joke, we almost um, made like a calendar for sale, and it was gonna be the hot boys at the Happy Farm D, and just like all the guys with our faces cut out and plastered <laughs> on obviously models you know <laughs> i think that'd go over well yeah, people definitely like conveys it. happy yeah right. <laughs> <True. laughs> we decided not to we decided to not go that route but <clears throat> me, I, I don't know i want to i want to do something more like that well honestly what i like about what you guys are working on is that it's something insanely creative. Um, when I heard that a pharmacist was leading a documentary project, I was like, I have to meet whoever this person is. I don't care who they are, what they've done. Maybe I do, I don't know. But <laughs> like, I knew I wanted to meet you. And it's almost been two years since we first started mm -hmm. talking. Um, so thanks for coming on and sharing more about your story. I can't believe that it's taken two years for me to even say like, Hey, you're working on this. I need to tell more people about it. So I'm sorry that it's taken me this long. No, it's all good. We did a LinkedIn live in July. I think That's it was true. That July of 2022, we did a LinkedIn live. Um, but your memory yeah. is so good. I told yeah. you elephant. <laughs> That is my parlor. So I have a really good memory and it's very useful for making a documentary. Um, but yes, my name is Dr. Anais Webster Minuti. And um, I first met Alex in virtually, of course, in 2022, February. And we started talking about this project because as many people know, um, I wanted to make a documentary. And so I reached out to my network and started just doing it from really, really grassroots. So we started with a just collecting stories because they started pouring in. Really, we started our go or not GoFundMe. We started our Twitter account and our email address and website in January of 2022. And the stories started pouring in so quickly. Our website was just black text on a white background. It was a placeholder. It was terrible, but people didn't care. They were like, wow, someone wants to tell our story. And so we just rolled with it. And we had a lot of informal conversations, just getting to know people, pharmacists and technicians and patients in the industry. And from there, we cut together our teaser trailer, which is on our website. And that was our crowdfunding trailer for our first trips. And so we did a GoFundMe push and it was very successful. We were able to take... Um, three trips in total using a combination of that money and a little bit of investment, like seed investment money for that first round of um, shoots and investment dollars. And we hit the road and let people know we were serious about telling the story of pharmacy. And we'll get into it a little bit more in the podcast, but I want Kristen to have a chance to introduce herself. But we started off with a one idea of what was going on in the pharmacy industry. We had one hypothesis, but this is a documentary, not a propaganda film. So we realized the scope changed a lot as we kept learning. And like I said, we'll get into that more, but it's been a really, really successful couple of years. And 
a lot of people don't know this, but this is like breakneck pace. We are doing this grassroots. We are doing this differently than a lot of documentaries because sometimes your development process alone can be five years because you want to get all of the um, different things in place before you start shooting. But we knew the importance of getting this story out there, making it pharmacist driven, making sure we tell our story correctly and accurately and entertaining so the general public cares and understands. So we did a little guerrilla, we did a little um, different style of documentary filmmaking and um, we've taken an exciting pivot now that we've gotten our footing a little bit more. But again, before I get into that, I'll turn it over to Kristen. Uh, before Kristen, you introduce yourself, I, I do want to point out that what you're experiencing is very normal. One of my favorite documentaries of all time, The Lord of the Rings, famously took many, many years of development before it was ever produced. That was a joke, you guys. I mean, it's not a documentary. <laughs> it's just the best movie that was ever made. Yeah, um, 10 years. I'm pretty sure their development was like something five. like five years. <laughs> so. Yeah, three, five years, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sorry, Kristen, you were about to say, well, how did you step into into this because when I first met Anais, it was it was her and a few TV people with this wild and crazy idea. And now uh, I believe that you're a pharmacist as well and getting involved in this process. What what made you say, yes, I want to get involved? Well, it started when I exited the workforce. And that really? workforce was PBM. <laughs> so <clears throat> actually my experience with PBM when I started wasn't all that bad. Um, a lot of people don't realize how much you can do within a PBM from a clinic, like a pure clinical standpoint. My work for the past almost decade within the PBM industry was managing hospice and palliative care uh, patients, their medications. So we took phone calls from prescribers constantly, daily, and they sought us out for recommendations on how to manage their patients' opioids and other symptoms for palliation of, uh, or other uh, medications for palliation of symptoms at the end of life. And these people were very complex. They couldn't swallow. <clears throat> you often couldn't get a line in them. Mm. Anyways, did that for a while. Um, really enjoyed it. It was really re rewarding work. But I got to the point where I was sort of at the top of where I was going to be with that place at the small PBM and decided to move to a bigger PBM and thought it couldn't be a whole lot different. I was proved wrong, at least from my expectations. I was, when I transferred over to that other company, I was blindsided by some of the workings practices i didn't really agree with some of it so i actually didn't stay there um very long at all and ended up ended up leaving because i just didn't agree with uh some of the things that i knew about or saw mm. and also was extremely imbalanced work work life situation i was working most weekends um just not something i signed up for now, through that experience, I was also <clears throat> introduced to more of the realities and the impact on my colleagues who were working in retail, um, the impact of the companies that I was working for within PBM, um, understanding how it really impacted in a lot of times negative ways. Uh, my colleagues in retail pharmacy and independent pharmacies as well. So for that reason, I also couldn't really stay. And knowing for a long time what was going on and these challenges, there's 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 a lot of I will say there is a lot of room for improvement within retail pharmacy, within PBMs, within healthcare in general. And for a few years, I had been wanting to make a documentary about pharmacy because I think we can all agree, even despite the problems, no one outside of pharmacy seems to understand what pharmacy is. It's confused with uh, 
pharmacology. It's confused with pharmaceuticals. It's people don't know what a pharmacist is, what a technician is. Um, so from for a lot of reasons, I had been wanting to make this documentary um, and was introduced through a mutual connection of ours, uh, Anais and myself, a mutual connection introduced us. And mm -hmm. I actually- Blood Tanaway. Yes, her name is Blood Tanaway. And she's amazing. If you haven't heard of her, she is the, the founder and the pilot and the workhorse of Pizza is Not Working. Um, and through so through Bled, I was introduced to Anais and team, and I've been on the team for about a little over a year now. Um, and it's been an amazing journey. Um, it's, it's an incredible story to be told. Um, as Ani said, it started out with a hypothesis, a theory, a focus on um, the working conditions. But as we've continued through hundreds of interviews, we realized that the impact and the scope of this issue is much more than just the working conditions. So, mm -hmm. uh, and from that perspective, we're also um, pivoting in our story a little bit. So we can talk a little bit more about that, but that's that's kind of the scope of my background, where I came from and why I'm working on this project. You know, I have a theory. You you highlighted something that I've, I think most pharmacists would agree with, and it's that the public has a perception of us that's not the perception I think we would like them to have. Um, you know, whether you think about like, how pharmacy has become a convenience model, business model, that is, that, you know, we have drive throughs and, and so does McDonald's, right? And as soon as you make that comparison, you've now changed the entire business model, taking into account that most community pharmacy retail chains in particular, pharmacy is a loss leader, right? That's not where they're making a lot of their money. So, the perception of what we do as pharmacists is so convoluted to the public and even to our own families, right? People in our own families don't even really understand what we do. And I've long held a belief that if I were to be able to change that, I would create some sort of TV show or video game that would influence hopefully masses of people to say, this is really what we're about and do it in a fun way. Um, I think what you guys are doing is, is much more intense and probably more in line to wh where pharmacists are at informational, right? So the documentary format I think is great, but what I'm curious about, you know, Kristen, you shared, you know, your why in, why you're a part of this, but Ana East, you're the, I don't know if you're, you're, I believe you're the founder. I was going to use an analogy, but you're the, you're the person. I, I was the person. Um, right. Originally, um, like you were saying in the beginning, teams change when you're doing a startup, there are often people are different people who get you off the ground and get you started than um, continue on, which is totally normal. And but so you're the I was, parent behind the that. parent. Yes. And so I was one of the three co-founders and now it's, um, for the LLC, the LLC is a couple of us now, but I was one of the um, co-founders of the LLC that the documentary is being produced under. So we started a production company so that we could make this film. And it is it is my production company. Shots with that LLC. <laughs> why? Why go through all of this? Why, why, why tell this story? Yeah, what why, why are we doing this? What are we doing here? Well, it's really fun. So we'll start with that. I'm having a great time. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so, that's what I wanted to hear. Why so not? <laughs> it's why not? It's really fun. And so um, just as an aside, and then I'll get back to the why. Um, a lot of folks know from our social media, I just had a baby recently. And so I, you don't do something like this passion. It's because it's a lot of work, but it's also a lot of fun. So it's like, Yes, I am. I'm not spending time away from her. She like hangs out with me on every single call, but it's like, it's fun enough where I want to have my baby be a part of this process because I'm like, hey, little baby, we're having a lot, we're having a great time today. And we're doing creative work. 
And this is, this is awesome. I'm having a lot of fun. So that's why I continue, I guess, um, mm -hmm. in addition to really, it is a public health crisis as well. So that's going into the why. I was thinking about it from a public health standpoint, because when I made the transition, I was still working, I was working in a hospital as my main full time job, but I was still had my foot in the door at retail, just mm. kind of at the moonlighting situation. And while I was there, that was during COVID. So I did see some of what was going on during COVID. And I was like, this is a destabilization point. COVID did not cause the issues that we see in pharmacy. And we've known that from the beginning of this film. However, it really revealed a lot of the things that were able to be kind of kept under control for the last several decades. And so it was kind of that um, straw that broke the camel's back. The thing that broke the dam was COVID because it was, here's a lot of extra workload, which is why it started off as a workers' rights documentary. Here's a lot of extra workload that there just isn't the support to be able to keep up with, which some of uh, some of it is not the fault of the corporations. No one expected a pandemic. That was on no one's 2020 bingo card. But then people are like, well, this is still what has been my reality for the last 5, 10, 15 plus years. And so the reality that pharmacists have known about was finally butting up against the reality that the public saw. Because before we were able to keep it under control enough where the public didn't necessarily see what was going on behind the counter. And so I was like, patients aren't getting their medications. You're hearing stories of delays. You're hearing stories of pharmacy closures. Patients are like, why is the pharmacy being run so poorly? What's wrong with this manager? I don't understand, et cetera. And I'm yeah. like, that's not what's going on. There's a lot deeper of root causes that need to be revealed. And a documentary is a great way to do that. And that's why I started because I was like, we need to expose to the general public all of the things that are going on in pharmacy because people aren't getting their medications. It is not safe place to not be able to get your medications for days. There's, um, I remember reading a news article that we um, took a look at. This is probably January of 2021. So it was before doing this documentary of a person who he had a heart attack, went to the hospital, got a stent, came out, had a prescription for an anticoagulant. There was a delay. He missed three doses and had a subsequent heart attack. And so they had these issues have real world consequences. And I wanted to explore, okay, what is the root cause and how can we become a better healthcare system in the ideal state? We know a documentary is the start of a conversation. It's not the finish. We're not going to suddenly change healthcare in the United States because of our documentary or suddenly change pharmacy, but we're going to start a conversation about this is what's going on so that others can get united behind this project and continue that conversation so that pharmacists are able to practice and deliver patient care in whatever that setting is to the best of their ability. And we can take it to the next level, whatever that looks like for that individual person, whether that's someone who is at a chain retail pharmacy they deserve safe, supportive staffing that we should, um, let me let me roll that back, please edit this a little bit. They deserve safe, supportive staffing in that environment. If they don't want to like pivot 100% very quickly whiplash style, um, lay a shingle, become an entrepreneur, because a lot of times people are like, well, that person just leave, just quit your job at CVS or Walgreens and become an entrepreneur and just open your own store or do whatever. And it's like people, if you don't want that, you should have a safe, supported working environment. Alternatively, if you're ready to go and you're like, I want to be on the cutting edge of pharmacy, I have a cool pharmacogenomics business. And I think precision medicine is the future using AI and blockchain 
you should be able to do that because the public should understand the value that a pharmacist is bringing to be able to implement services such as these. And um, this really goes into the mission of this documentary. And so I don't know, Kristen, do you have it in front of you if you wanna go ahead and just read that out? I don't have it in front of me, but I have it in my head. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be better. <laughs> better. And our mission, simply put, is to change America's perception of pharmacy and the practice of it for the better. Hmm. Again, we're not looking to change the world. We're not looking to solve the problem, but through conversation, change could be incremental. It can be drastic, but to some degree through this mission, through this project, we want to open that conversation and budge that needle a little bit closer to improvement. I think it's an interesting mission because I believe one of our main problems is pharmacy doesn't know what it wants to be. We've got these desires to be mid-level practitioners. We have this desire that we want to be clinicians, but the market is telling us our main and primary role is the community pharmacy and the market is not demanding, you know, services from pharmacy. They're not demanding, bashing down the door saying, please sign me up to talk with my pharmacist. Let me pay for this. And insurance companies, government, they don't, they're also not demanding this. There's this conflicting identity crisis going on. And I think having an open conversation is a great, I mean, start to helping us figure out okay, public, here's what's really going on with us. We don't like it either, <laughs> but we also don't have the solutions in our own hands to be able to influence, you know, what is going on. So I'm curious, as you like are interviewing what sounds like dozens, hundreds of mm -hmm. pharmacy professionals, technicians, managers, directors, maybe even executives, are Something you getting... If you're an executive listening, our doors are open. Okay. On every podcast, our doors are open. We would love to hear your story. Especially from the PBM side. And I'll explain more in a moment about that. Okay. Invitations sent and hopefully people will respond. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you have maybe a pulse on this? Do you feel like pharmacists feel powerless about some of these obstacles and challenges that we have? Yes. And so um, this is a good way to introduce another part of our project that we are working on. We realize that this scope of this project does not fit um, on a screen, whether we end up with ultimately doing a feature film length, so a movie length, or if we're picked up to go to series, it's still not that many hours of television. And so we're actually writing a book alongside the documentary. And in that book, one of the chapters is nobody, nobody listens. And um, we, for each of the chapter headings in our book proposal that we're putting together, we have an epigraph that we start the chapters with. And that quote is um, nobody cares because every interview, um, almost every single interview at some point the person, usually they laugh before it, which is very interesting in and of itself, but they'll kind of chuckle to themselves and then go, yeah, nobody cares. Nobody cares. And then um, I recently, our documentary page joined a Facebook group. And even on that initial post, there was so much support for our film, which was incredible. It was, it's really exciting to see when you go into a new group and how excited people are that we're doing this project. But Every time we enter a new space, we do have someone say, yeah, but nobody cares. The patients don't care. The doctors don't care. The public doesn't care. And so people feel powerless. And when you feel powerless, there's a lot of different ways that you respond to that emotionally. And some of that is just shutting down and being like, nobody cares. I'm not even going to worry about it. Comedy comes from great tragedy, right? Yep. Um, and it's a tragedy, which is probably why at some point they just laugh to themselves because it, to them, it may feel like, what's the point of fighting, mm -hmm. but 
you know, I learned about a story um, when I was younger. I had pretty nasty uh, acne, um, and I got put on <laughs> edit. <laughs> what, what's it called? Accutane. Accutane. God. Okay. Isotretinoin. Anybody? Yeah. What's that? Isotretinoin. Yeah, I I knew that, but obviously, <laughs> Accutane is. <laughs> you're like I've been out the game too long. You're like, <laughs> yeah, I you know don't talk to me about pharmacy, like the actual <laughs> medicine or the practice of oh, it. Oh man, can we, can we, I'm a can job. We talk about the tragedy though, because I have a point about that. But go ahead, I want to touch back on the tragedy. Mm -hmm. And um, the comedy, because you also laughed a lot during your interviews, and I think that should be brought up. When we interviewed you, you laughed a lot. You were a primary example of that, Alex. Yes. Really? Yeah. <laughs> we'll play it back it was like in the documentary because it was really good, but you laughed a lot. Maybe because I'm so separated from it and I see the problem for what it is. I don't know. I think we laugh at irony and ineffability yeah. like an inability to explain something that's complex and frustrating and all these emotions at once you're we'll keep all of this in the yeah, whole we, the right. whole the whole part with me messing up accutane even the accutane part yeah <laughs> so what's so interesting about that comment is if people are saying nobody cares that's like the heart of the problem because we f care i forgot mm -hmm. that we don't, we don't have parental advisory on our podcast. So I keeping it PG, no one <laughs> cares, but we do. And it's such a moral injury to our very souls and being knowing that we care so much about everything and about people. And yet we have been pushed in this environment that forces us to literally stop caring. Mm -hmm. I um, care about the Accutane story, so I actually really want to know the direction you were going with that. <laughs> me too. <laughs> I think I've lost it, but let me start it up. So when I was a kid, uh, I tried all the typical stuff they recommend with acne and none of it flipping worked. And my doctor finally said, well, there's this very dangerous drug called Accutane. Um, uh, but you got to go to a special doctor and you got to get referral and you have to make sure that you're not, um, you're of, you know, sane mental mind. So as a kid, I was like, oh, okay, well, there may be someone who fact checks me on this. I could be wrong because I learned this as a child. So this is my perception at the time we had a local state representative in my area named Bart Stupak. Bart's son committed suicide. Very unfortunate event, right? It happens. I don't know all of the details, but my understanding was, was that he had committed suicide while taking Accutane. Now, all of that, my understanding is, and it's, <laughs> I'm going to get a comment, hopefully that tears me apart. But my understanding was, is that that all brought forth lawsuits and demands on Accutane to say things like you, you need to not be depressed if you take this, you blah, blah, blah. But I think at the heart of that situation was a very unfortunate and public event that forced a drug company to change its policies and procedures for patients. Where I know where I was going with this story. It's very unfortunate that this happened. It's not anyone. It, it, how can you come back from something like that? However, what I know changes things in America is great tragedy. It's things like 9-11, school shootings, mass murders. It's horrible events that shifts how the public sees the world and causes great changes, whether the country went to war in Afghanistan to insane policies and procedures that are being even now introduced. And 
I am so hopeful that your documentary can make a dent in this conversation because what I'm most afraid of is that someone's child, my child, has to die in a system just to create some changes. And I don't know what that tragedy would be. We could get really crazy and negative about that. But my point was that I, I hope it doesn't happen while you're shooting this, but I'm imagining that the healthcare system is going to break at some point and something crazy is going to happen. I don't want to sound like a doomsday person here, but we all know that this isn't sustainable. What we're doing can't last forever. The model just doesn't work. So to your point, and get ahead of it. Like, let's figure out what the new system can be so that we can lean into that, a new and better way of doing things so that we don't have more politician sons dying and, and blaming a drug. And let's get ahead of this so that we can save more lives. Yeah. Hmm. Sorry. <laughs> no, it's all good. I know Chris <laughs> has a point she wants to make about that. And then I that spurred two thoughts after. Kristen, goes. what were you going to lean into? Let's see if I can hold on to these thoughts without losing them. Uh, <laughs> the first is that I think we're already starting to see a system that's not sustainable in that. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of examples of this. It depends on how you see it. But for example, uh, the walkouts, and even just people leaving pharmacy altogether, you have an entire retail chain pharmacy system that is suffering. And by default, the patients that use this system and these services suffering because the pharmacists and pharmacy technicians working these, in these locations are hurt. They're worn out but also they care so much about the safety of patients and uh, protecting their own licenses, of course, um, that they're choosing not to work in this type of environment and bless those who choose to do so or don't, who, could, who continue to work there anyway, but not by choice. Hmm. Um, I think that's um, such a, it's a valuable role. It's a vital role. Um, but again, we're seeing the unsustainability of the system already in that we can't keep staff and we can't keep doors open. We can't get prescriptions out on time and, and so on. And then regarding the tragedy piece, I think that just from the experience we've had with interviews and seeing where things are going from an advocacy standpoint and, and elsewhere that, you know, I feel like we're going to swing back into pharmacists being more of the prestigious interprofessional healthcare collaborator. And what I mean by swing back into that is if you look not too long ago, several decades ago, pharmacists were sought after, highly sought after by the community, by physicians, by patients alike for, for their expertise. Back then, it was a prestigious, glorified position. And the folks, the, the professionals back then didn't even have doctorate degrees. Through consumerism, through the retail setting, through capitalism, we've destroyed that image. And now we're the most trained we'll ever be with doctorate degrees um, and some even receiving community pharmacy residencies if we're talking about you know, retail pharmacy or community pharmacy setting. And we're perceived as being animals in cages, pushing pills. And so I think with the push towards prescriber status, um, entrepreneurism, really pushing 
for recognizing and valuing pharmacists for their cognitive services, we're going to swing back to that era, so to speak, where we're being utilized to our fullest potential and practicing to our fullest potential and being hopefully rewarded at the federal level for that. Um, and by that, I mean provider status. So it's it's a tra it seems like a tragedy right now, but I feel like you know what goes what what goes down must come back up again. And mm -hmm. that's that's kind of how I see things. Mm -hmm. Now I have a third point because you made <laughs> such good points. So I'm gonna start with my third point. Um, sure, and then work backwards. Um, so with provider status, like something that we've noticed doing this project is because people feel powerless things there are a lot of things that trigger folks and provider status is one of them that we and that's just observational like when provider status is brought in up, what way trigger them like so a lot of people are like why are we focused why we i say we like i'm in, i'm just documenting this you guys <laughs> um, <laughs> same here <laughs> yeah we're just documenting this um why are organizations focused on provider status when I am drowning in my store. Yes. And so what we are trying to accomplish our documentary is you can hold two ideas or multiple ideas at the same time. And there are multiple truths because that pharmacist doesn't feel supported when they feel like their associations are focused on provider status. However, on the flip side of that, the organizations are focusing on provider status because if we can shift away from the dispensing based model to being paid for cognitive services, being paid for consultations, et cetera, and get paid for those things, that's when the stores can be staffed enough. And so it's a conundrum that these two things feel like they are at odds when maybe they're not, maybe they are. That's the part where it's like, that's up to you, the viewer and the reader and the people consuming this project. That's up to you to decide. We're not deciding that for you. Whether you think provider status is good, bad, or neutral we want to present the different lenses through which something like provider status can be viewed. And um, with that being said, I want to, I'm going to pull up some stuff from our book proposal um, on my phone because there's a few excerpts I want to read um, that I think are very, I don't know, timely. <laughs> oh, the chapter is the mask of complexity and the facade of simplicity because they make things so complex and we had someone on one of our interviews said complexity creates opportunities for value and value creates opportunities for economic benefit the system is intentionally so complex that it it's intended to be that way so that you can't make change you can't press forward it makes it possible for a lot of this infighting to go on and then another chapter that i thought a heading was very um relevant to this conversation is called the slowness of instant gratification hmm. because a lot of these issues have been going on for decades and people are like well it should be fixed instantaneously and it's just it's year after year decade after decade of people saying well why isn't this being fixed faster which makes it in some ways go slower, slower. because it's like well i want it fixed now but that doesn't give us the time to kind of look at this is a change that's going to take place over many, many years. But if you're constantly like fix it quickly every single year, rather than looking at this longitudinal plan, it slows things down. For example, we run into this with the documentary a lot. A lot of people are like, man, it's been two years. Hurry up. Go faster. Like, why are you not done with this documentary? And the other thing we get is, will this be relevant? If this takes you another year to film, will this be relevant um, in 2025? I love that question. I love that question. People are like, <laughs> will it be relevant? And we're like, yes, a decades long issue is going to be fixed by next year. We would love that, please. That's wonderful. We're doing a historical documentary in that case. It'll still work, but we don't think that'll be the case. 
I mean, there's documentaries about World War II and the Chinese dynasties. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yes. But on top of that, um, I think what you highlight is a uniquely American perspective. I mean, just 10 years ago, you know, we didn't have the AI technology access, right? Actually, just a year ago, mm -hmm. not 10 years ago, right? I mean, mm -hmm. OpenAI released ChatGPT literally a year ago from when we were recording this. So we're used to constant change in our society. But when you think about the, the political and the bureaucracy behind everything that's going on in the healthcare system, mm -hmm. there's no way we're going to be changing that ship's direction in five, 10, 15 years, unless something majorly bad happens, which is a possibility. That's totally yes. plausible. And I want to read, I have, um, if I can find this excerpt really quick about the that tragedy point. Um, it's basically talking about like the fact that people already have died. And it is worded really well and lyrical and poetic but i can't find exactly where it was but it's basically talking about what is that what does that tragedy look like in a system where patients have already died because of some of these issues and patients have already been harmed and that harm is not enough to move the needle what is the degree of harm that needs to take place what is the high profile nature of the harm that needs to take place etc to move this needle what are those what kind of impetus for change do we need in this country for it to to shift and mm. that's something we are exploring we don't have an answer to it's a big big question but what are you guys working on next what's the next milestone for your documentary um but i can go you can go either way um the Next milestone for our documentary, we are currently, so I mentioned at the top of this podcast that we kind of did this documentary in a unique way compared to how it's done traditionally. Um, we are actually, because we were scrappy and did it a little non-traditionally, we were able to build up enough um, clout and respect that we um, have enough, that we have enough legitimacy to attract the attention of Hollywood and people who have experience in the entertainment industry and they have partnered with us. So we have brought on an award-winning consulting producer and an award-winning director to co-direct the project with me. And these folks with their decades of Hollywood industry experience and their industry connections will make the pathways to, the pathway to getting in to onto a streamer, which has always been the goal, it just makes it more straightforward because there's a lot of options for distribution out there. Um, most people know about the streaming model, your Netflix, your Hulu, your Amazon Prime, but there's a lot of new channels for distribution that are out there. There's Fast, there's AVOD, there's Freebie. So there's these ad supported video on demand platforms that are really taking off and looking for high quality content to put on those services because people will watch a free movie if it just happens to be on netflix is raising their price again people are leaving a lot of these other streaming models to go to the free models because they're like it's getting expensive and so those places are looking for content then things like airlines cruise ships they also need content so if you make a 90 minute film that's perfect for a flight and it can go on the shorter flights too and that is another avenue we had no idea, which is why you partner with experts who know more than you, who can get you in those doors so that we can make a project that's excellent. And that excellent is excellence is going to allow us to open a lot more doors, which has allowed us to make the pivot away from simply looking at working conditions and getting a lot of stories from people like a lot of pharmacists, a lot of technicians and patients to let's talk to leadership at some of these corporations. And I think Kristen had some um, things she wanted to share about that point. Yes, um, I think also just, just real quick, I'll piggyback on something that Anais said, and then I'll go into the next steps for um, 
what I will be focused moving forward. But um, I think at the beginning of this episode, we mentioned something about going at breakneck speed, which I think a lot of people might interpret as um, sacrificing quality, right? But the really cool thing is that we have been able to attach to our team, secure on our team, um, a director, co-director that is extremely well, ta extremely talented and well and experienced in making films, low budget films, look like they're ten times the the, the cost to make it. So we're really excited about that. And it truly is striking that balance between going as quickly as we possibly can, but also ensuring high quality content mm. and, and art, art, artistic um, ability. So I wanted to bring that up. Um, the other thing. The other thing I wanted to mention, it was about going forward. So what's next? Yes, we're in the process of um, bringing on investor dollars so that we can make this a high quality piece um, as quickly as possible. But also adding to the quality of this film and the legitimacy and the credibility of this film is what we call access. Yeah. Not the pharmacy access that we typically think about, although that ex it's extremely important and a topic we'll cover. But when we're talking about access, when it comes to filmmaking, we're talking about representation on the film. Hmm. So when you bring in all sides of the equation or as many sides as, of the equation as you can and as many perspectives as you can, that's when you gain more perspective um, higher quality content, more robust um, project and representation. So one of my goals will be to try to connect with and get the perspective and input and insight of PBM corporate. And the reason we want to do that is not only because we want to be more credible, be more rounded and robust and bring perspectives, it's not just for that, but if we're really interested in driving conversation around solutions, hmm. what are the obstacles in the way? What are the things that are actually maybe good things that we need to amplify? And I'm talking specifically with regards to PBM corporate. Where I came from, I've seen some things internally, for example, that are not congruent with the common complaints on the outside. That may be the typical behavior that we see on the outside, but I know for a fact there's a lot going on inside PBMs that appears to be good stuff. A lot of pharmacists working in PBMs and other folks understanding that this is their perception and, and some of these behaviors, trying to make those better. So when we can address these accusations or concerns or failures and see what PBMs might be running into um, or what they're doing um, that's good, that is actually making a positive difference on patients and employers in the health system. We need to amplify those things, mm. make them known so that we can pick up on those pieces and perpetuate, I don't, for lack of a better word, propagate and perpetuate them um, and see if there's right. any obstacles that could be removed that might be in the way of doing better. We'll yeah. see. I know a lot of people out there are saying <laughs> that's a bunch of baloney. Um, you know, she must be crazy because clearly it's this or that. But my argument is that unless we put as much of this on the table as possible from all sides, we will come to a better solution, a more feasible solution. <laughs> well, where would you like people to stay updated? Where can they go to support what you're doing? So there's a few ways you can support us. Um, please follow us on social media. Right now, our handles are at shots with that. 
for most of our social media platforms, except LinkedIn, which is Would You Like Shots With That? Our website is shotswiththat.com. You can also send us an email at producer at shotswiththat.com if you wanted to reach out to get more information that way. Um, if you have stories for us, please, um, rather than sending us an email or DMing us on social media, please go to our website and fill out the share your story form. That form helps us organize the stories that we get. If they get sent to us via email or DM, sometimes it's just they get they can get buried, they can get lost, but that form is our organizational tool. So it is on our website, shotswiththat.com. And if that is the place, if you're like, wow, I have a really, um, I have a story I want to tell. Hmm. It, you don't, don't even characterize it. If you're like, oh, I don't think it's related, or I think I'm too far outside of the industry. It's not. We um, read through all of those stories and it's helpful to us. Even if you think, I don't know if this is related enough for me to be able to fill out that form, go ahead and do it and give us a follow on social media, like our posts. Um, that really helps us out. And please, please, please spread the word that this project is happening. Thank you so much for sharing. And I'm excited to see the documentary. That was a great conversation and I'm so thankful that both of them were able to share their journeys as they create this documentary in real time. We're seeing it happen. My hope is that they will be able to complete this project, but I know that after watching my wife actually go through like production in a, in a small budget series here in the town, there's a lot of weird things that go on. Sometimes you wonder like, wow, why does it take this long to make a movie? It's complicated. There's a lot can go wrong and right in a process. And the creative process also influences how things are done. So anyways, my hope is that you go to their website, you follow them, support them, share some love, share some encouragement, and even be as so bold to reach out to them to see how you could be involved. The more we get out there, this message of, hey, pharmacy is important and we need to do something about it, the better. So thank you for listening to this episode. And until we see you in the next one, take care.